Good morning, everyone. I'm really thrilled to be here. I think this is a landmark discussion and an opportunity for us to collaborate. Uh, so I have been asked in my comments today to talk with you about a few areas. Um, how FDA encourages broad stakeholder efforts to generate drug development tools. How FDA responds to the rapidly changing scientific landscape. How we incorporate the patient's voice. How we can collaborate with other reg regulatory agencies toward greater concurrence in regulatory requirements in areas of unmet need. Uh, benefits of such collaborations, especially between the US and EU. And then, of course, how we measure success. And I have quite a lot to cover, so I'm going to move very quickly. And let's see if we can move forward. So I think we all generally agree that, that drug development evaluated tools, evaluative tools, are a tremendously neglected area. Uh, right now, the concept is, you know, take a tremendous amount of time building the airplane. This is an analogy. And then seeing whether it can fly. Uh, we realize that better science is needed to predict and assess safety and efficacy of investigational products. And we also realize that there are a lot of causes of failure in phase three of clinical development. Uh, lack of effectiveness against placebo or an active control. Um, unexpected drug toxicities that may not have been borne out in early clinical development. And commercial non-viability. What we have coming out may not be better than the existing therapy. So th these are some of the challenges we grapple with. We also understand that we need more evaluative tools. Uh, we have a large amount of biochemical and molecular knowledge, but few ways to assess the state of the entire organism and the impact of those interventions at the organism or at the patient level. Um, a lot of our assessment tools, they're not standardized, so there's a limited ability to compare one experiment, so to speak, with another. Um, lack of insight into the variability of treatment response in patients, even in current therapies. And as a result, some of the clinical development programs are, are brute force efforts, empirical efforts, and they're extremely costly and time consuming. So we all understand this. The FDA has put together a series of reports. Uh, Moving back to the critical path opportunities list, our opportunities report, trying to chronicle and outline these areas where we think we need targeted interventions. Uh, the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, of which I'm a member, um, has identified their science and research needs. They pulled together a report in July of 2011. And then most recently, you'll see uh, there's a report on advancing regulatory science at FDA, a much more global understanding of where our needs are for the agency. And so with that, a lot of common themes keep coming out, needing new endpoints, needing new trial designs, uh, better understanding of biomarkers for subsetting disease, both looking at prognosis as well as response to therapies, use of patient-reported outcomes, how we incorporate the patient voice, uh, needing to conduct natural history studies to understand a disease course, uh, particularly in rare diseases. This is an area we're also having a lot of input. So I want to talk to you a little bit today about what our center is doing to catalyze movement from concept to action. And these are areas where we're actively engaging. So this is just a snapshot of some of our collaborative efforts. And you'll see that we are engaged tremendously with the Critical Path Institute. Um, of those seven or eight programs that Martha chronicled to you this morning, we are involved in every one of these. We have liaisons from our center that sit on calls, that attend conferences, that are active partners in trying to understand where those unmet needs are and how we can work together. One of our colleagues here was talking about the Patient Reported Outcomes Consortium and that FDA sits on those calls and is actively engaged with those consortia. So this is just an example of the types of public-private partnership activities with which FDA is actively in involved. And this is not all of them, but this, these are the ones that we have active liaisons and are actively in engaged in. With that, we realize that as we're engaged with these public-private partnerships and consortia, we also have to have a receptor on our end to look at what comes out of those consortia and then to determine whether these tools that are being created can be qualified for a particular context of use. And when they're qualified for a context of use, the agreement from our FDA is that then the next drug developer coming in the door using that qualified tool doesn't have to reinvent the wheel again to show us all of of that exemplary data that qualifies that tool. And at this point, we've developed three pathways for qualification of a drug development tool. For clinical outcome assessments, this is the patient reported outcome tools, for biomarkers, as well as for animal models. And uh, this is animal models under the animal rule. 
These are just three of our initial pathways. We anticipate, hopefully, with greater uptake and greater input into the qualification process, that maybe we'll have additional pathways available as well. But again, these are our first pathways where we're seeing the greatest areas of needs. And we're getting a tremendous amount of input in terms of uh, letters of intent that come in from our consortia, uh, drug development tools that they would like to have qualified. We go through a consultation and advice phase, and then we go through an evaluative phase to determine whether those tools can be qualified for a regulatory context. Uh, this is just a snapshot of our web page on our DDT qualification programs. I'm sure the slides will be available to you, but this is the link to information on our programs. We also are very focused on clinical trial designs we, and, and, and really focused on guidance development. Guidance is our best way of, of, of letting the external community know what we want to see, how we want to see it, and some of the challenges we faced in terms of new trial designs. And this just gives you an idea of the, the breadth of innovative trial design concepts that we are are developing pub, and publishing guidance on adaptive trial designs, non-inferiority trial designs, how to deal with multiple endpoints, how to deal with enriching patient populations when you have biomarkers that may specify a certain patient group who may benefit from a particular treatment, how you deal with missing data in trials. Oftentimes, a patient may be lost to follow-up in a clinical trial, or you may not have that data. How do we deal with missing data? Also, topics that we are working on are meta-analyses, how we look across studies um, and approach for efficacy and safety data. And we also are in the process of finalizing our draft publication on the qualification process for drug development tools. So this just gives you an idea of the variety of activity that's ongoing within the FDA. Another area of great interest for us is data submissions. We realize that one of the core underpinnings for how we are able to advance drug development paradigms and how we're able to leverage knowledge is to really start to look at standardized data. So if you look at the picture to the left of the slide, you see that still we get a lot of submissions at the agency in paper format. These are bins of paper that sit in front of our reviewers' doors. We want to change that, where we go from paper submissions to really fully electronic submissions. And with those electronic submissions, fully standardized data, so that it makes it easy for us to look at clinical trials, look across clinical trials, look at class effects, leverage knowledge, and really be able to utilize electronic tools that will help us rapidly access clinical trial data. We also are very focused on creating an integrated workforce. We realize that our population of regulators are aging and that we also need to be training the new workforce. We need to be having and developing people who understand regulatory science, that understand new types of trial designs, that understand how we incorporate the patient voice. And so we are focused on creating that integrated workforce, focused on training in clinical investigation, drug development science, regulatory science, medical informatics, and computational science, which is a core need, as well as statistics. So the concept is really for us to create an integrated training hub for online deployable training for international investigators, for international uh, groups that really need to understand how the drug development process is changing and how we need to incorporate the patient's voice. So current areas of activity, as you can see, and the bubbles, we, we are focused on looking at trial designs, looking at modeling and simulation, looking at how we incorporate new drug development tools. We are focused on, on underpinnings of data standards that really need to help us knowledge ma and manage all of the information that's coming at us. We're focused on training and new paradigms of training and how we collaborate internationally. Uh, we're focused on building clinical trial networks so that we're able to leverage that best knowledge. And we're focused on data sharing. And uh, I know that's one of the key topics that we're, we're very interested today as well is how we share data, how we pre-competitively can leverage the existing knowledge. So another question we were asked is how we can collaborate with other regulatory agencies most effectively. 
Um, one of the key areas is data sharing. Uh, one of the areas that I can point to, which is a, a, a wonderful example of where we're starting to move in the direction of data sharing, has to do with the area of renal biomarkers, biomarkers looking at kidney injury. And there we see a tremendous collaboration between the CPATH Institute, between the IMI, and the Biomarkers Consortium, where we're all working in the same space, and we need to share that information to hopefully be able to leverage and move forward with identifying new biomarkers of kidney injury. Uh, we also are focused on, on cooperation as associated with data sharing, sharing plans early, coordinating activities with our international partners, sharing best practices, uh, coordinating data requests so that when we have information coming to us through our qualification program, we have a similar program in EMA. How do we coordinate those most effectively so that we're not asking our consortia to do duplicate work? Sharing discussions around key initiatives and activities and outcomes. Examples of this um, include the Predictive Safety Testing Consortium and activities that are very linked to what's going on with the Safety Consortium that the IMI has. Removing the redundancy, proactive sharing of strategy and plans, and, bu and building collaborative IT platforms, areas where we can share information more effectively. How do we measure success? And uh, this was a question that was posed to my colleague, Dr. Eichler, as well. Well, one, one way we measure success is looking at approvals of new medical therapies and how we are able to expedite those approvals. But that's, that takes a long time. Another area where, that we look at to measure success is development of new guidance, how we utilize new information to infuse into uh, the regulatory process, integration of novel biomarkers into regulatory review, proactive sharing of pre-competitive data, development of data warehouses based on standardized data and, and so that we can leverage that prior knowledge, streamline coordination of information among international regulators. I think these are all examples of how some short-term low-hanging fruit wins and some longer-term wins of how we can show success. Uh, this picture just shows you, um, this is hot off the press as of January, um, the Center for Drugs uh, New Molecular Entities Approvals. And if you look at the graph here, uh, it shows from 2003 to 2012. In the dark green, you see the number of new molecular entities approved this past year at an all-time high of 39 new molecular entities. And in the light green, you see that this shows the trend of the new molecular entity applications that were filed. So for instance, um, in 2012, there were 41 applications for new molecular entities, and of those, 39 were approved. So we're hoping this trend is moving in a better, better um, direction, but the whole idea is really to try and get the best and most safe and most efficacious therapies to patients. And this just shows you an example of the types of significant uh, approvals that occurred in the past year. So finally, trying to move quickly, I'm going to leave you with a proposal. And the proposal really is hearing the, co the concepts that have been described this morning, we really need collaborative platforms that provide a global mapping of public-private private partnership activities. Michelle talked this morning about developing those networks uh, within Europe of how we're collaborating. What I would pose is that we need to take that even further and build an international uh, network so that it makes it easy both internally to have an interface for public-private partnerships to collaborate and share information safely and also to have an external interface that allows potential stakeholders, patient groups, and others to identify efforts that are going on efforts that they may want to support, efforts that may have important outcomes that may impact patients. And so really needing to have a network that allows us to identify current efforts for collaboration internationally and target gaps for future development so that we're not recreating the wheel. And that concludes my comments. I really appreciate your attention. Thank you.